Good evening, Bruchim Habayim, and welcome to the ZOA's Young Professional Committee's second presentation. And as Alan said, I'm Judy Rosen. And why, may you ask, have I chosen to be the ZOA, ZOA National Vice President and the Chairman of the Young uh, Professionals Committee? Because the ZOA, the very first Zionist organization in America, is the conscience of American Jewry. It has been fighting right against might in the US Congress, in the President's Conference, on college campuses, and in every newspaper in America, wherever they, we've been allowed to print. And although it is mostly an uphill battle, history has proven that ZOA has come out with the just truth time and time again. And the Young Professional Committee, well, it's the key to the future of ZOA, the new leadership from post-college through the 40s, who will continue to support and grow our beloved organization. And your job is to invite your young leaders to sign on to our rosters to help us build our constituencies of young people post-college through the 40s. This meeting was designed by the Young Professional Committee. I will now introduce Laureen Lipsky, a member of our team, who will introduce our featured speaker. Laureen is a pro-Israel advocate and an op-ed writer. She has been featured in Israel Hayom, Alga Minor, JNS, Times of Israel, and recently wrote a piece uh, uh, entitled Semantics of Anti-Semitism Exclusively, Exclusively for the Center for Security Policy. Following our speaker, Marlene Artov, the ZOA Tri-State Campus Director and Young Professional Coordinator, will conduct the questions and answers from the chat Zoom uh, bar on your screen. So now, Laureen, take it away. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Judy Rose and Marlene Artov and the ZOA Young Leadership Committee, we welcome you tonight. Tonight's presentation will cover the shared struggle of both Blacks and Jews in America. And while our experiences differed, we fought back against hatred hand in hand during the civil rights era. Tonight, we are honored to have Joshua Washington as our featured speaker to walk us through the rich Black Jewish relationship in this country and to further explain how certain leaders such as Louis Farrakhan and the group Black Lives Matter diverted from our strong bond. Joshua Washington is the director of the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. Joshua is also a graduate of Christians United for Israel's 2016 Diversity Outreach Mentoring Endeavor, where he received training in Israel advocacy for diverse audiences. A talented musician, he directs music at the Congregation of Zion and directs a K through 12 music school called the Zion Academy of Music. Joshua writes and speaks extensively on Zionism and civil rights. Welcome, Joshua. Thanks, Laureen. And it's great to be here with ZOA. Thank you for having me. And um, I hope that you all get something out of this. We have, we have a little bit to talk about today. Um, and so I'm going to just jump right into it, if that's okay with everyone here. Uh, there's been a lot going on in the Black community, between the Black community and the Jewish community. And there there is some precedent for... Um, Unfortunately, I should say there is some precedent for what we're seeing here, um, and it, it actually goes back to to the 60s. Uh, the, the The name of this event is uh, the Black Jewish the Str Black Jewish struggle. What changed? And um, we're going to talk a little bit about what changed and um, what the, the the targeting that has been directed at the Black community in terms of changing our message and standing against the the Jewish people. Um, and so I hope to kind of get, bring those things to light for us today, um, if that's all right. I wish that I was in person with everyone because I like to hear like feedback and crowd participation and all that stuff. So you all are, uh, are agreeing with me and, and uh, shouting, you know, positive affirmations and things like that just to help me feel better. But um, I'm going to go ahead and start with this picture here. Okay. Um, Oftentimes, 
when we talk about the black Jewish historical relationship, usually the picture that we see the, the two people or the person that comes to mind is, is Dr. Luther King. Um, and usually there's a picture of him with, with Rabbi uh, Joshua Heschel, which it's a powerful picture. It's a powerful relationship for me. The relationship, uh, if there was a cornerstone or a linchpin that that kind of stamped the or, or marked the beginning of, or I, sh I should say, have the, the symbolism of the Black Jewish relationship to me would be Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington because it was their relationship that spawned a generation of highly intelligent, highly successful. Um, powerful Black voices uh, in our community. Uh, people like Langston Hughes, Maya Angelou, um, the recently uh, passed away uh, Congressman John Lewis, um, thousands of kids. They, the, the two of these people together built over 5,000 schools in the segregated South and on the East, in the, on the East Coast. And these, th that alone, to me, the education is the foundation of of, of any people moving forward. And Julius and Booker T. Washington definitely saw that and recognized that. And their efforts together um, is what is why we have this, why we had the civil rights leaders that we had, um, why we had the Harlem Renaissance. Um, they're a big part of why, you know, I'm sitting here today presenting to you. I mean, the, the effects that they've had on Black Americans in terms of our education um, can't be quantified. And I think that this is kind of the, 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 the genesis of all of that. I have just a couple pictures for you here, some of the schools uh, that they built together. One, it's a, um, it's not, it's, it's a more recent one. Okay, so we're gonna talk about Zionism and civil rights, okay? And I wanna first start off by um, giving you some context, a little bit of backstory, okay? So the SNCC was the State Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, it, was, it was a very, very popular organization in the 60s, especially in the 60s and 70s. Um, this committee had mem members on it who were responsible for uh, the Freedom Rides, their efforts to end um, segregation, like bus segregation, of uh, their efforts to um, include uh, the, the Voter Registration Act, um, their efforts to actually um, end discrimination in many parts of the South, even in the parts uh, that became, even after the Civil Rights uh, Bill was passed, there was still de facto segregation in many uh, places in the South. And so SNCC was responsible for bringing that to light um, and combating it. They were a nonviolent struggle. They, they um, at the time when they began and in their beginnings, they, they exemplified Dr. King's philosophy of, of nonviolence. Um, unfortunately, that wasn't always their intention as, as they grew, as they, as they grew in number. And then also as their membership started to get older and older and they brought on younger and younger members, SNCC started taking more of a radical shift. And what I mean by that is the, the one event that really um, cements this shift was just after the 1967 war in Israel, the Six Day War in which Israel uh, won. Israel did not start, but it finished. Um, there was a, com the SNCC wanted to send a committee to investigate the Six Day War. This was because at the time, SNCC is what, what they call it. SNCC really wanted to take more of a global approach to their uh, their stance for justice. And because of this, the the person who volunteered to go and investigate this, her name was Ethel Miner, uh, she was supposed to go and investigate and come back and basically host these discussions, these debates. She was supposed to write a position paper and all these things. She never did any of that. What happened was um, right after she came back, uh, SNCC posted this document called Test Your Knowledge. It's, it was a document of what they called it 32 documented facts. And mo some of these are lies that we might recognize now. These are all libels against the Jewish state, the Jewish people. 
Um, it was it was kind of a drastic shift from what SNCC used to be. SNCC had so much support from the Jewish community, um, from from the Black community, from the White community. A lot of people who who um, supported SNCC who were very shocked at this article that came out. Not just the the list that they had, and some of them include what you might see here. Did you know that Zionism, which is a worldwide nationalistic Jewish movement, organized, planned, and created the state of Israel by sending Jewish immigrants from Europe into Palestine, in parentheses, the heart of the Arab world, to take over land and homes belonging to the Arabs. There's so much wrong with that one sentence. Um, and there's 32 more of these just like this. And some of them go way out to just the most, um, the, the, the most common tropes that you would even hear today. And what's even, I think, what, what was just as uh, disheartening were, if you look at the actual document, um, is, are the paintings that were drawn as well. Um, the artist that drew, there's a couple more in the document that had these very anti-Semitic drawings implying that Jews were puppet masters, they controlled the world, all this stuff. So it was a pretty drastic shift. And I remember reading this and I wasn't sure what led this to happen. I was aware of the fact that there was um, a very strong attempt to get the Black people to accept this Palestinian narrative and attach it to our cause. But I didn't understand why SNCC shifted so drastically until I found some archives um, written by um, a Stanford professor who at the time was one of Martin Luther King's, um, doc he, he, kinda, he documented a lot of stuff uh, in, in, during the time of King's day. And, and he just, he had a lot, he has lots of writings that are still in Stanford's archives today. He noted why this drastic shift. One of the things was very simply, Ethel Miner, uh, the one who, who came up with this document, she was already, she had close ties with the Nation of Islam at the time. And she was friends with, um, she had Palestinian students who were her friends who were very anti-Israel. So she already had like these, these close affiliates with, with just rabid anti-Semites and, um, yeah, and, and like I said, and Palestinians who, who gave her a different narrative and the wrong narrative, I should say. And um, so it wasn't really a, what was supposed to be a, an objective critique of the facts turned into um, this bashing of Israel and the Jewish state. SNCC quickly lost their funding um, from a lot of their Jewish donors. Um, and um, they, they never stopped or reversed course. They doubled down. Um, I remember that the, the, the president of SNCC at the time um, was kind of concerned about what was going on. And, and some of the younger members felt that he, he wasn't radical enough. And so they wound up voting in a new president who was only president for a short amount of time, H. Rat Brown. But he took the organization in a direction that was very much, that very much mirrors what we're seeing today in, in Black Lives Matter and in some of the movements that are affiliates of Black Lives Matter. And I'll talk about that a little bit today too. Okay. So, um, back up. So now all this is happening again, this is right after the 67 war. So the year after that, Dr. King was at the, the rabbinical assembly for conservative Judaism. And he had a very lengthy conversation with one of the rabbis there as a part of the, the event. Um, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole interview is documented and the transcripts are still online today if you want to find them. But something very interesting that he said was, um, so first of all, the rabbi asked him, basically, what would you say in response to the rising tide of anti-Israel sentiment coming out of the Black community and anti-Semitism coming out of the Black community? He said, um, you know, there's all this talk about Israel being um, an Ill illegitimate state, colonizers, all those things. He asked him, he said, would you say, would you point out that Israel ha is uh, over half, um, you know, Arab or Mizrahi Jews as well? Or would you point out that it really isn't, um, it really is a hateful thing to say that uh, Jews are colonizers and why they're wrong and all those things. And, and Martin Luther King responded with three, I think, very important points. The second one is one that we may be most familiar with, but the first one he says is that there are those who are color consumed, who see a sort of mystique in being colored. 
and anything non-colored is condemned. He said, we don't follow that course. Then he talks about how Israel is um, the only viable a democracy in the Middle East. He sees Israel as an oasis of brotherhood. I'm an example of what can be done in a desert land. And then he pivots and talks about what, what peace for Israel looks like and then what peace for, he said the Arabs, because the Palestinian wasn't really a term at that point yet, but he was saying what peace for the Palestinians in that land also looked like. And he talked about how peace for them looked like the economic um, upliftment that they that they so desperately need. Um, and to this day, that is still very much true. And I think that if, you know, if Martin, saying what he said now, just based on his words then, I think that if Martin Luther King were asked about Israel today, um, he would follow up on those things that he said and say, okay, well, what about the economic uh, condition of the Palestinians? And I think that he would be very disappointed and shocked to find that, that the Palestinian Authority receives so much aid, none of it goes to the people. Um, this, is, this is something that was very much a part of Dr. King's legacy, his Zionism, his stance with the Jewish people, and his commitment to justice. And that not only um, stayed with him, but that is very, very evident um, in his, his legacy with his, his followers. Um, Dr. King's right-hand man, Bayard Rustin, if you see he, him there, he was one of the people mainly responsible for the, the, his, uh, the, the marches that he led. I mean, he, he was right there with Dr. King. He was the one who introduced um, Gandhi's uh, philosophy of nonviolence to Dr. King in the first place. This, this is a very important man uh, in Black history. Bayard Rustin, um, after Dr. King was assassinated, so Dr. King, after he said what he said, was assassinated 10 days after that um, event that he was at. Um, some years go by and you see this, this anti-Semitic, anti-Israel sentiment intensifying in the Black community. And this compels Bayard Rustin to form an organization called BASIC, which stands for Black Americans Supporting Israel Committee, started on November 23rd, 1975. This was the same year that the UN um, came out with, with Resolution 3379 saying that Zionism is racism. This was not only in response to that, but in response to um, the events leading up to that, which is some of the events that I just told you about. Bayard Rustin saw what, what, he, what he saw as a um, something very, very um, not good for the Black community that was rising up, something that was very, very terrible um, and really bad on the horizon. And he was seeking to combat that with BASIC. So you can see that's him all the way on the, the far left and then right next to him was A. Philip Randolph, one of the other founders of BASIC. That's him sitting with Dr. King, that's John Lewis, Coretta Scott King with him. Uh, a couple other people there were sitting next to them. Basic uh, had the support of a lot of major, um, big name uh, African American uh, figures in that time, like a you know baseball star Hank Aaron. Uh, you see Ralph, uh, Reverend Ralph, Ralph Abernathy, Louis Armstrong. Uh, you might recognize some other names here: Rosa Parks, uh, Martin Luther King Sr., Coretta Scott King. see that there, Barbara Jordan. And here were basics seven tenets. One, we condemn the anti-Jewish blacklist. Two, we believe blacks and Jews have a uh, common interest in democracy and justice. We support democratic Israel's right to exist. Arab oil prices have had disastrous effects, disastrous effects upon blacks in America and in Africa. We support peace through mutual recognition. We support genuine Palestinian self-determination. We will work for peace. These were, these were basics seven tenets. Bayard Rustin himself, even outside, uh, outside of basic, was a very, very voice. Um, when the UN came out with that resolution 3379 saying Zionism is racism, 
Bayad Rustin in an article expressed, Zionism is not racism, but the legitimate expression of the Jewish people's self-determination. From our 400 year experience with slavery and segregation and discrimination, we know that Zionism is not racism. He even goes further in a New York Times article to, to uh, implore the, the black community to please stand against Yasser Arafat. He very much condemned uh, PLO terrorism and he was seeing this kind of alliance between Yasser Arafat and some of the black leaders. And he wrote an article saying that by standing with the PLO and Yasser Arafat, we risk three big things. And these are the three things he said. First, we risk causing serious divisions within our ranks. Second, we risk the forfeiture of our own moral prestige, which is based on a long and noble tradition of nonviolence. And third, we risk becoming the unwitting accomplices of an organization committed to the bloody destruction of Israel, indeed the Jewish people. These, this was by at Rustin. This is Dr. Martin Luther King's legacy. So now, what did Bayard Rustin mean by those things that he said? Well, I'm one to believe that he spoke prophetically, just like Dr. King spoke prophetically. One of the things that Dr. King said was um, that if this anti-Semitism continues that there, you know, if, you know, if um, there isn't a sort of a martial plan for the Palestinians, um, for the Arabs, for, the, for the, the poor Arabs in the Middle East, that there'll be this endless quest to find scapegoats. Um, and by addressing in what he said about us giving up our moral prestige, us giving up our moral, moral voices and becoming unwitting accomplices uh, to, to, to the destruction of Israel. Those things we're seeing today, what, what's happening right now, these are the grandchildren, if you will, of that generation. And what Dr. Martin Luther King and Bayard Rustin warned us about is happening right now. And it's happening right now in many forms, but one in particular, um, the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, I'm going to share this one more time with you. Okay, make sure everyone can see that. Okay, so I have a few examples here of what's been going on with Black Lives Matter. And, you know, I want to first address this. I, I wrote an article very recently addressing this issue, which is there's been a lot of, a lot of debate, um, I think, within both the Jewish community and I think within other people who really want to support Black Lives Matter about whether or not they should support it. Um, and that Black Lives Matter is separate from moving for Black lives and all those things. And I, I disagree with that notion. Um, they're, they're not separate. The only thing separate about them is that they have different names. Um, Move for Black Lives was founded by Patrice Colors and two other uh, women. Patrice Colors also founded the Black Lives Matter, uh, the initial Black Lives Matter movement, and she came up with the slogan and the hashtag. Um, and the though there may be chapters across the U.S. that, that don't have this kind of global platform of, of delegitimizing Israel. The ones that are that have the most membership and the the mo the biggest and loudest voice are the ones that are making all this noise and and doing all this damage. And I'll show you what I mean right now. So this is just one example. This was a march that was <clears throat> just that just happened this past month in July in D.C. There was a student named uh, I can't remember. His, uh, I think his name is Justin Tabash. He said. There was a march, they marched to the Capitol and then he stood up and gave a speech and said that um, Black Lives Matter and Palestinian human rights are intrinsically linked. Th this is what he said. He did a whole poem about, um, about how Israel is so terrible and all these things. And one of the things he said in this poem, he made an allusion to, he said, actually, he called Israel the puppet master continents. His words, these are words, the, the movement. Um, there's another big uh, protest in LA. If you can see on the right side, that's Words of Black Lives Matter um, and Movement for Black Lives, Patrice Colors. Okay. On the left, you see one of the organizers and founders of Black Lives Matter in LA. Um, she's a professor, Melina Abdullah. She's a professor and she's a very, um, she, she's, she's a very big supporter of Louis Farrakhan, of Islam. She's known for saying a lot of things. Um, and 
she was there when the when the protest turned into that wanted to join and and stores and things like that but uh be saying no this is what it is and we're, we're coming for these people like this is what it is um from the jewish community in la the rabbis that were there have said one of the rabbis there said you know i was there during um uh the, the watts riots you know after Roddy king was killed and no jewish place was touched this was not an accident this was very deliberate um you know he's I, i've lived here through these things and and not once did uh was any jewish establishment uh uh, targeted. He said, "This is a very, very deliberate. This is a very, del very deliberate thing." Okay, I'm gonna keep going here. I don't know if y'all saw this painting. Um, I mean, I mean, maybe like two, a day or two after George Floyd's killing, this was put up, and this was going around, spreading like wildfire. I mean, all the events that were, um, all of the the anti police events, the the Black Lives Matter events, the other um, organizations like Jewish Force for Peace. They, they use this thing here to imply that um, Israel the thing that we did to George Floyd. And also not even to imply, but to say that uh, US police officers, how to oppress black people in America. That's what they're saying. That's what they're saying and that's, that's what they're fighting. So the, the fight we have on our hands is one of equating anti-Israel sentiment, anti-Zionism, with justice. It's no longer a, you know, just a blatantly hateful group. It's they're, they're, they're attaching this, if you're going to be a black group for justice, then you have to stand against the Jewish state. They're making it like that on purpose. So Black Lives Matter in different parts of the U.S. has been successful in severing ties between some of the U.S. police departments and Israel. One of them was in Durham, North Carolina. Um, that was a unanimous vote, six to zero city council votes to um, ban um, the relationship between uh, Israel and the, uh, the police force in Durham, North Carolina. And by the way, you know, this claim that they're making, not only is it just completely false, but Israel doesn't even train uh, police officers here in the U.S. on domestic, you know, affairs. It's, it's purely counterterrorism. They're, they're only training on their, they're sharing their um, counterterrorism techniques with the police departments in the U.S. This has nothing to do with how you deal with, you know, people on regular people on the streets or people who are suspicious or nothing. Like, it's 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 counterterrorism, <clears throat> and not to mention the fact that the U.S. also works with other countries in the in the world. So not only is it not true, but now there's just this singular focus on Israel, um, which is in in by definite that's anti-Semitic. Because um, it's wrong and you're not even addressing what happens with the other countries. This is another one in Minneapolis. Um, and this, again, these are efforts led by Black Lives Matter. Okay. Now, this event I went to um, because of a friend of mine from the Atlanta Israel Coalition invited me because we're doing an event uh, later this week or next week to kind of address this with, with the founder of Gilly. Uh, which Gilly is the, the exchange program that uh, Israel has with the Atlanta Police Department. And she invited me to this, so I went just to see what was going on. Um, it was just, it was a bunch of baloney. I mean, all the claims they made, they didn't back up with anything. But what was interesting to me was that, again, you had this just attempting to kind of fuse um, Black issues and Palestinian issues together. This was not an event that was sponsored by Black Lives Matter, but Black Lives Matter was represented there. Um, and why wouldn't they be? This is exactly there. This, they have already successfully did this in, in two other cities that I just showed you. So this is an attempt by, this was a, an event led by Jewish Force for Peace and some other people. Um, this is an attempt, attempt to continue to cut ties between the US and Israel. Um, and like I said, even though Black Lives Matter wasn't, they didn't officially sponsor this, this is their agenda. Um, this is this is something that has their approval and people from there were there. They don't hide this. This is not something that we have to dig to find. They're proud of this. This is this is the whole concept of intersectionality, which is that we're all connected in our struggles and 
oh, I'm separate from this group, or from that group, they're both struggle against, you know, they call, you know, against white supremacy, against the evil colonial, you know, Jewish state. This is something that they're proud of saying that they have the support from people around the world. Um, and then another one, that same example, I, I'm sure you guys saw this one too, an event hosted by Muslims uh, for abolition. Um, and on the poster, it said that it was open to all minus cops and Zionists. Again, the Muslim, Muslims for abolition is, uh, they're one of Black Lives Matter's partners. They've done events together before. And again, at the event, people from Black Lives Matter were represented there. And again, why wouldn't they be? This is their platform. This is what they want. Them. And so when we have, we have these um, platforms that BLM stands on, and what you have also are these attempts to stack the platforms on top of these anti-Israel agendas saying, well, you know what, you can't really stand for this unless you stand against the Jewish state. And that's what we're seeing more and more. I'll show you a tweet from Black Lives Matter UK um, after talks about Israel and the annexation of the West Bank, they call it Israel. Seller colonial pursuits, we loudly and clearly stand beside our Palestinian comrades, Free Palestine. I had some people tell me that, oh, Black Lives Matter UK is separate from in the US. Again, go on their website and they'll tell you in their about section. Black Lives Matter Foundation Inc. is a global organization in the US, UK, and Canada. They're telling you, right, they're, they're proud of this. They, they, they want to be, this is what their goal is. They're all connected. Not only are they all connected, but Black Lives Matter, the, the, the anti-Jewish sentiment coming out of Black Lives Matter is connected to the other um, anti-Semitic, uh, the other, all the other anti-Semitic things that we've been seeing lately, these, these past couple of weeks coming out of the Black community stuff from uh, Louis Farrakhan's recent speech on 4th of July saying that he prayed that the Jews of Florida would be infected with COVID-19 because they're responsible for the U.S.'s bad relationship with Fidel Castro in Cuba. That's what he said. You had uh, Deshaun Jackson and his brother in the NFL sharing the, that fake quote from Hitler that was going around talking about how the white Jews are fake and the black Jews are real, which doesn't even make sense for something like someone like Hitler to say. There's no basis for anything. I mean, there's the, some of this stuff is so ridiculous that it's like, I can't believe we have to actually do work to show you that it's not real because it, he, it doesn't even make sense with Hitler's ideology to even say that the real Jews are in the US. Okay, then what, what was he talking about then when he was talking about annihilating the Jews of Europe? It doesn't make sense. But again, when you have this vacuum of knowledge and education, it gets, it will get filled with something. And, and what we're seeing right, right now is um, people like Louis Farrakhan, people in the, in the Nation of Islam, Black Hebrew Israelites, they're, uh, they're filling these vacuums with their own nonsense. And we, as in the Black community, are eating it up. And it's, it's affecting our culture. It's affecting our politics. Um, there, there are a couple of presidents of NAACP chapters that uh, were, were reposting and, and tweeting and, and posting very blatantly anti-Semitic things. They were retweeting Farrakhan's quotes about the Jews. There's one who was fired, but he still controls the NAACP New Jersey page, even though I've been reaching out to NAACP many times. There's another one in Philadelphia. Um, there are people who sit on in positions of power um, who call Jews brutes. There's a, a, um, a board of education leader. I, I can't, her name's escaping me right now. After the shooting that happened in the Jewish Delhi in New Jersey, she took to Facebook to denigrate the Jewish people. It was like right after that. There were people in the streets in the aftermath of the shooting that happened in New Jersey by two, uh, one of them was a, was a member of Black Lives Matter, I mean, was, of Black Hebrew Israelites. There were people in the streets in the aftermath talking about how the Jews deserved it. They need to get up out of here. And that we, we know, and, and so, and I'm not saying this to scare you because again, this does not represent the majority of African Americans, but this is affecting our culture in a very negative way. This is poison that has been injected into our veins from people like Louis Farrakhan, from members of the Nation of Islam, who by the way, have a lot of young members who have a lot of influence now, and people in, in the Black Hebrew Israelites. And that has no doubt um, gotten, uh, that has no, that no doubt is also in Black Lives Matter. So when we say that, um, we want to stand with Black Lives Matter, but we need to, but it needs to rid itself of the anti-Semitism. We're only talking about the symptom. We're not getting at the root. It will never do it until we can um, pull it, uproot it from the ground up. And one of the ways that Ipsy does that, we proactively um, 
go into these communities. We partner with organizations like, like ZOA and we teach, we, we partner with, with other black organizations, go to churches, wherever people will have us. And we, we proactively teach these things because that is the only way that we can combat it. We can't keep responding to the attacks. We have to go on the offensive. Um, I don't know how much time we have. It's just, I, I'll just tell you what this video is. Um, and you can see it, you can find it on our Ipsy website. It's the founder, Patrice Cullors. Um, she talks about how in, this was just in December, 2019, by the way, just a few months ago. She was on Al Jazeera. She was interviewing Al Jazeera, talking about uh, solidarity with the Palestinians. And she said that um, a few years before, they took a delegation, they meaning uh, Black Lives Matter, they took a delegation to Israel. She called it Palestine, but it was in Nazareth, which is in Israel. And she said that there were people from Dream Defenders that were there, which is an organization led by Mark Lamont Hill. There are people from Black Lives Matter that were there. And she said, you know, and we, they did like a, a, pres a demonstration there where Mark Lamont Hill said like a poem and then, um, you know, people were chanting and holding hands and walking around in a circle or something like that. And she said that, um, they were laying the foundation for a more public face in solidarity. That, that's her exact words, that they were laying the foundation. She, her intention is to forge this Black Palestinian solidarity. She makes no bones, no bones about it. There's no, no one's hiding anything. This is her intention. She founded this organization. She founded the Move for Black Lives. She started the whole slogan, the hashtag, you better believe that she's, her intention is for, even if they're all decentralized and disconnected, her intention is to, she, okay, I'll, another quote from her. Um, after the, the LA, um, what happened in LA with the protest, she said, we're laying the groundwork and foundation for a new world, not just for our descendants, but for right now. This is a separate quote, J June, 2020. So this was, this was after Hollywood. She, her whole intention, and not just her, that she has two other founders with her and there are other people involved as well. Their intention is to kind of, is to reshape the fabric of our society as we know it, to stand against Israel and the Jewish people. Um, it's not just happening culturally, it's happening on an education scale right now. I don't know if you are aware, but um, we're partnering with some organizations to come against this new ethnic studies curriculum that's coming out in the California Department of Education that has a lot of anti-Israel stuff and a lot of bias in there. Um, a lot of just straight up anti-Semitic things in their teachings about Israel and just one-sided, lopsided teachings about how the Jewish state was formed. Um, this is, this is <clears throat> an all-on assault on the minds of young Black uh, people today. And one of the, like I said, the, the biggest way that Ipsy combats that is through education. So... Um, and I, I know we I, we want to open it up for questions, so I want to pause here, but you can join our mailing list by going to ipsy-now.org slash contact, um, and we can uh, continue to keep you updated on our efforts. There's a lot that we're, we're taking on in 2021, and I'm so excited. I can't share anything with you right now, but I'm really excited, and I want you all to be the first to know, so please join our mailing list, um, and yeah, I'll take uh, questions from here. Yeah, Joshua, thank you so, so much for that fascinating presentation. Before I take some questions, I just wanted to remind everyone, I just, sorry, I just wanted to remind everyone that we do have two more Z08 programs happening this week. Tomorrow at 1 p.m. we have book club featuring Rabbi R.A. Shapiro and Thursday at 7 p.m. Greater Philadelphia Z08 is hosting Why Do Christians Support Israel and Is That Support in Jeopardy? The links will be in the chat so make sure you register in advance. Um, Joshua, if you're ready for some questions, I am happy to ask some that were in the chat. So we had yes, one Okay, great. So we had one question. Can you briefly elaborate and discuss um, about Malcolm X and his impact on the Black Jewish relations and maybe on some influence he had of the SNCC leadership? Sure, yeah. So first of all, so yeah, Malcolm X, and um, I didn't really, I didn't touch on him at all, not because he's not important. I mean, he's a very crucial figure. <clears throat> but, um, you know, he, I think, was had was on this arc of, of transformation even up to when he was killed um and it's an opinion of mine but i believe that if he if he hadn't gotten assassinated he would have 
his thinking would be a lot different than it was when he started. Um, he was very radical. Um, but yes, Malcolm X was um, very influential. Um, one of the things that he did say, though, about, um, about Zionism was that Black Americans do need something like that. And he was like, there, there needs to be a movement that's, that's like, I mean, this is, he, he saw it as this is, this is a liberation movement for the Jewish people. We need our own kind of thing, a liberation movement in that way. Um, and I think later in his life, he talked about, um, he, in, like, pretty, a lot later in his life, he made a, a whole speech about how um, some of the ways that we, as Black Americans, can support ourselves. Um, and, you know, and, and again, kind of citing the Jewish community in that, you know, why are we waiting for other people to give to us what we can actually do for ourselves kind of thing. Um, and so I believe that even though he did have an influence on, um, even though he was, he was a member of the Nation of Islam, he didn't, he didn't have an influence on um, that movement and, and people who followed, um, I think that his, his breakaway spoke volumes um, and that, you know, a lot of things that he said coming toward the close to his assassination was actually in opposition to uh, the Nation of Islam and things that were going on on the inside. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I think that he could have had a bigger impact on Black Jewish relations in a positive way. And again, this is just my opinion, um, had he had the opportunity to continue his life. Um, so yeah, I mean, he, he's very influential. And I think that it's unfortunate now that, you know, we don't have um, an honest voice like that, or an, an, a lot of honest voice like that, I should say. Um, we have people like Louis Farrakhan, who, um, I mean, he used, I think in the 90s, he was like kind of more of a joke. And I feel like he's become more relevant now than he's ever been, um, which is which is very unfortunate. Um, but again, that's why that's why Ipsy exists to, to fill that gap, to fill that void. There were also some questions in the chat about BASIC, the organization. So first, is BASIC still around today? And then the second part of that is, it seems that there were some very notable people that helped get the organization started. So why isn't it something that is more popular and better known? So BASIC isn't around today anymore, um, which, is, which is why Ipsy exists. I mean, when my dad found out about BASIC, when, when, when my dad founded Ipsy, it was because he found BASIC um, in, a, in a library, some newspaper clippings. I mean, he said, he, I think he said he cried. I mean, he, it was just like, he didn't know that something like this was around. Or he knew, but he just never, he didn't know, you know. And, and BASIC doesn't exist anymore. And what, what we believe in all of our research is primarily because Bayard Rustin was really the, the, the tool that kind of made basic go. He was the, he was the cog that really made everything work. Um, he was really the main one taking that proactive stance again and again and again and again until he, until he passed away. Um, and when he did, I don't believe that there was really anyone to take up that cause uh, for real. You had a lot of people who were signed up with it, but um, there wasn't anyone I think with, besides obviously Martin Luther King, but he was, he had already passed. There wasn't anyone with Bayard Rustin's fortitude and um, uh, passion for the Jewish people and for Black Jewish relations to really keep BASIC going. And unfortunately, some of the people who signed on to BASIC um, later in their lives became anti-Israel. Um, and I think that's part of it is because, you know, um, there's, there's a scripture that says, without a vision, the, the people perish or they cast off restraint. And I think that he was the vision. Um, and so one, one of the things that we were trying our best to do is obviously learn from past uh, failures and successes and all those things. And what we're, what we're attempting to do now at Ipsy is to really uh, train and equip and, and disciple young um, African-American um, people in the, in the intellectual space, people of influence, young people who are coming up um, because we want to instill that passion into them so that Ipsy doesn't also just kind of fall by the wayside um, when we're gone. So yeah, that's to the answer to your question. Yeah, if that answers it. Yeah, I think that's great. Also, there seems to be quite a few questions asking about 
is V and, and your organization. So can you tell us a little bit more about some successes that you've had and maybe what more either you do or we can do about re-educating black leadership to once again stand with the Jewish people? Sure. I mean, yeah, so so Ipsy is primarily a media and education resource. We're like a library and we partner with a lot of organizations. Anyone that will have us, usually it, it's it, they're Zionist organizations, but as best as we can, we try to partner with other black organizations, um, churches, synagogues, um, who are, colleges, whoever will have us. And we educate um, because we see, like I said before, this vacuum of education. We, we want to to combat it with with the truth with real with real education um and so what that's our biggest effort um you asked uh oh how so yeah so one of the things that we yeah so some of our success stories are you know we we've been doing a lot of these events and really there's no there isn't really not that we've seen anyway um any black organization or um even um you know besides a few exceptions any black leaders who are saying the things that Ipsy is saying. And I think that, especially right now in this volatile time, um, I can't tell you now in these past few weeks even, how many times I have um, gotten messages, emails, personal texts or whatever from, from some of my black peers and other pe people who follow Ipsy, just saying that they really appreciate the context that I'm giving to what's going on. Um, I, I wrote an article, two articles ago, I talked about, like it was called the Palestinian appropriation of black pain. And that one sparked a lot of conversation. And um, one of the things that a friend of mine um, messaged me was just to say thank you for helping because she had been seeing a lot of, um, you know, this, this kind of, um, these Nation of Islam talking points kind of going around and around on social media. And she actually was buying into some of it. And there wasn't anyone ex except some, maybe some of her other, you know, non-black friends, probably her white friends or Jewish friends who are posting uh, contrary things. But, you know, when, when things are that volatile, you know, unfortunately with, with this mindset, it's like, well, you're not black, so I'm not going to listen to you, which is unfortunate because the truth is the truth no matter what, but that's what's happening. And so when someone like me, who's not Jewish, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm black and really um, otherwise to what it would seem to other people is I don't really, you know, have any kind of like stake in this, from what it seems anyway to them, posting this stuff, it really does, I think for a lot of people, um, raise more questions. And for some people, they actually appreciate that because, you know, either they were buying into it or they just, they just knew that it wasn't right and they didn't know how to, how to respond to it or what to say or what to do. Um, and so Ipsy has been um, effectively doing that and we're, we're seeking to take that a step some more intentional programs that we're currently working on now um we're, we're really excited about so yeah. and i think we do have time for just one more question so there was a question in the chat if you could please clarify we often hear that the black lives matter movement stems from the black lives matter foundation but they're not exactly the same thing and that one is more radical than the other is there a difference can you clarify on that what is what is going on with these movements mm. so to me and, and this is something that i've been kind of going back and forth with people about and i've kind of come to realize that you know i need to I need to see for myself anyone in Black Lives Matter, whether it's the foundation of the movement or whatever, however you want to separate it, condemn this hatred that's going on. And, and I don't see any of that. So I, I hear a lot of people say that they're different. Again, I don't hear that from people inside the movement. I don't hear that from people inside the foundation. I don't hear that from people who move for Black Lives. I only hear that they're separate from people who, um, from, from allies, if you will, people who want to be a part of it. Um, and so to me, we can only, to me, I, I would only, I would say be cautious to make, to, to try and make that distinction because no one on the inside is making that distinction. Again, and I'll say this again, that yes, there are chapters that maybe aren't aware of, 
they do. But the problem, the bigger issue, and I can't stress it enough, is that the ones that have the most pull are doing the most damage between Bushans. And until I see a Black Lives Matter chapter, chapter stand up and say, this is not cool, we don't stand with this, and we welcome our Jewish brothers and sisters, you know, we, we don't, we don't even, they don't have to be Zionists, just, you know, we don't, we don't really take a position on that, like, we don't know enough to really speak on Israel, we're just kind of focused on police brutality, but the problem is, again, is that the messaging that's going out is directed even at the more passive ones saying that, okay, but Israel is responsible for police brutality. So now it's like, unless you are a Zionist, you're going to subscribe to this doctrine, because why wouldn't you? I mean, why wouldn't you? If you're, if you're saying you stand against police brutality, and then someone comes and, and shows you some pictures, and some doctored videos, and some other things saying, okay, Israel's responsible, then even the person with the best of intentions is going to stand against the Jewish state. So I think that the conversation needs to shift from, um, you know, what parts of Black Lives Matter can we join, and really should shift to, okay, you know what, how can we let the truth come out, you know? And again, so two things. Oh, sorry, I need to, I need to say these, last, these two things, Marlene, this is okay. Um, Go ahead. Uh-oh. Um, so... Um, can you remove that screen share? I'm so sorry, Joshua. Oh, no problem. Right, that's not yours. I'm understanding that correctly. That's, this is not mine, no. Okay. It's, it says Beth Chernoffs. Beth, if you can, uh, I don't know. There we go. Okay, um, great. I forgot that. No problem. Um, so I need, I need to say these two things, and it's that, um, so Black Lives Matter is, is, is the newest thing, right? First it was BDS, and BDS is not as, Black Lives Matter is infinitely more um, dangerous than BDS because everyone, virtually everybody knows what Black Lives Matter is. The average person doesn't know what BDS is but the average person knows what Black Lives Matter is. And, but, you know, today's Black Lives Matter, or tomorrow it'll be another group organization that kind of dons this whole agenda. Um, I know right now it might be difficult to, um, you know, if you want to support the Black community and you see Black Lives Matter everywhere and you want to support Black Lives Matter. But I'm telling you, first of all, there are other organizations. One of the biggest examples is the Woodson, uh, the Woodson Center. Robert Woodson is a man who's had this center for decades. 40 different states in the U.S. They combat. Um, they they do it. They educate. They educate young black uh, kids. They combat violence. They 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 do this uh, anti-violence training and, and and anti-gang violence and all this stuff. And they, they really do have. They have made some tremendous strides in their organization in communities across the U.S. That's just one example. Um, there are ways to support the black community that may not put you on TV or show that you're you know obviously supporting them. Um, but there are other ways to do it without supporting this group. And, and, I, and again, I, I stress this because I need to see someone in the, in the organization unequivocally stand against um, this hatred of the Jewish people before I can even have a conversation about the difference between the foundation. And the, I mean, I, for right now, and I'm being very honest as a black man who's been saying, I don't care. I really don't care. I need to see someone stand up and say, okay, no, that's wrong. And that's not us. Otherwise, and it, we're all, it's just conjecture. We're all just kind of speaking for them. And they're already speaking very loudly and clearly about what they want to do, um, at least on a, on a broader scale. So, yeah. Joshua, thank you so, so much for your time today and for that wonderful presentation. I do have one more favor to ask you. There are some people that are looking to get in touch. So if you could just post that email in the chat, that would be great. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you all for participating. We are so excited that we are launching our young professional division here at ZOA. So if you are a young professional or if you know a young professional between the ages of 22 and 40, please make sure you're following us on social media and stay tuned for our upcoming young professional programming. ZOA really does so much important work through all our departments, through outreach, through our Center for Law and Justice, through government relations, and through campus programming, and none of this could be possible without your support. So if you have any means at all, all your donations go directly toward fighting for the Jewish people, and you can donate at zoa.org. Thank you so much for joining us today.